before we start the show, we would like to thank our sponsors for 2024 Beef, Beef Master Education Endowment Fund. Uh, thank you for what you do for the breed, and thank you for supporting our show. SEBA, the Southeastern Beef Master Breeders Association. Uh, don't miss their convention and sale every August. Thank you for supporting the show. Emmons Ranch Beef Masters, Mr. Steve and Mrs. Cindy. They need no introduction. They always breed great cattle, and we just appreciate what you guys do, and thank you for supporting us. CNM Ranches out of Kershaw, South Carolina, the Chick family. Be on the lookout for their sale starting in 2025. Thank you for supporting the show. Lissy's Beef Masters so is another one that doesn't need any introduction. We appreciate what you do for uh, the breed and for our show. Cottage Farms Beef Masters, they have a sale with Clark Jones every year in June. Uh, thank you for supporting our show. Sea Shepherd Beef Masters, thank you for supporting the show out there in Texas. And Jones Beef Masters, uh, last but certainly not least, sell every June. They sell throughout the year. Mr. Clark, thank you for what you do for the breed. Uh, every day and thank you for what you do for our show jcs beef masters jared and kelly strickland out of savannah tennessee always raising great stock uh, thank you for what you do for the show and be on the lookout for their cattle and coming sales this year lastly gnm cattle company out of taylorsville north carolina family owned and operated uh, will be in multiple sales this year as well thank you to all of our sponsors we couldn't do it without you Welcome to Beefmaster Banner. We're your hosts, Josh Morrison and Jared Strickland. How's it going, Jared? It's going good. It's been a it's been a day. Cutting it close on getting here on time to do this with cattle running around in the road. <laughs> that, that that never helps when they're on the highway, does it? Yeah. You and the, and all the grass no. that they get to eat, and they still want to get on the road. Yeah, they, there's something about their neighbor's yard that they they like to to go eat on. <laughs> well. You know, speaking of uh, grass, I, it is nice to finally see the grass growing. Spring here, it was eighty four here today. I think it was uh, it was really nice to finally see some spring like weather. Oh yeah, we uh, we ended up. I have to do some pond surveys today, and it was kind of an adjustment. That's my first day, kind of full sun out on the water. I don't know if I got a little sunburn or what, but I, <laughs> it took me a minute to adjust. Probably did. Probably did. Uh, before we get into the show tonight, uh, we just wanted to remind everyone the committee meetings, the BBU committee meetings are coming up uh, May 6th and 7th. Um, you know, we, we we hear a lot of times people want their voice heard. Well, that's the place to come do it. Um, come on down to College Station and... It's going to be a good time. It was a good time last year where they had it and uh, just just come on out and listen to the meetings, listen to what's going on in the breed, listen to the things um, people have to say. I think it would give, if, if you've never been, I think it gives you a different perspective on things as far as what's going on in the breed and just how we're trying to promote it. And uh, me and Josh both plan to be there as long as things go straight with it. And if uh, we hadn't ever met you or something like that, I'd like to meet some new folks I hadn't met. So if you're there, hunt us up. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. We, we always enjoy talking and you, maybe you can critique us on the podcast and make us get a little better. That's right. <laughs> uh, tonight we have, uh, getting into the show, we have Rick Stone Cipher and Owen Stone Cipher of Cottage Farms. How y'all doing? Doing well. Yes, sir. Doing good. Well, just kind of getting in into it. Um, if y'all will maybe just take a minute and inter introduce both of yourselves since you've never been on here before, maybe give us a brief history of, of both of you in the cattle business and then, um, kind of just roll into the history of cottage farms. Uh, I'm sure everyone on here, I feel sure knows cottage farms, but they may not know the history behind it. Uh, I'm Owen. Stone Cipher. I'm a uh, Rick's nephew and uh, Scott's son. Uh, I help do the online um, marketing part of it. So I help with the Instagram and the Facebook, and I'm more with the relations. So anybody calls or texts or emails, I mainly deal with that stuff in the day to day throughout the cows. And I'm Rick uh, Stone Cipher. I'm one of the partners. Um, been doing it. 
I'm 57. I've been doing it since I was around 12. My dad started the business back um, 50 years ago this year, actually, in 74. So we've been at it a long time, um, had lots of sales. And so, um, you know, it's just in our blood, as, as Owen said, he's he's third generation. So we're um, we're proud of that and proud we got the next generation coming along, liking the cattle. Absolutely. Yeah, I was proud. I was proud to see him at the last couple of sales there and wanting to take take in and get big interest in it and uh keep it moving on. Yeah, it's neat to see the next generation. He and his brother both like it. So um so that's good because we know know what I'm doing is not gonna be a dead end at the end of the day. So <laughs> that's ex that's exciting. Absolutely. Now Going back uh, with with Cottage Farms when you started, I, I know a lot of people start kind of in the commercial world and then migrate to the registered um, side of things, the purebred side of things. Is that how you all started, or did y'all start um, differently as far as did you go straight into the beef masters? How'd that work? Well, my dad was raised on a farm growing up, um, and then when he moved to Jackson, his um, – uh, his roommate in college, Ray Woodson, had gotten into the uh, beef master breed through uh, J the Johnsons, the volunteer uh, ranch. And, and we had some commercial cows. He bought our first place in, I think, 72. He had some Hereford and Angus and all that. And, and back then, cattle prices were really cheap. I remember selling cows for $200 at the sale barn. And, so he really wanted something better to get more weight and get, you know, hybrid vigor in the cattle. So his, his, like I said, his roommate in college, Ray Woodson had beef master cattle. And uh, so he tried them and, you know, the calves weighed a lot more. And so um, that really kind of started it. He bought a bull and then, then he went out to Texas and bought um, from Homer Herring um, and the Harold brothers went to a couple of their sales and bought, bought some cows to get started and just kind of built it up from there. You know, a lot of trial and error. You got you go in there and you buy some, they work, some don't work. And um, just over the years, kind of fine tune the type of cows and the breeding program you want to have. Um, but, you know, he took it slow for a long time. And then Scott and I got involved and we kind of then took it even further and really got active in it. Well, that's awesome. Uh, you kind of mentioned about, you know, selecting cattle and different things like that. What's uh something that y'all, how do y'all make the, choose y'all's matings on your cattle? What y'all looking for and, and selecting a, a sire and a dam and, and things like that to, to move your program forward, you know? Well, you know, really, I believe in complementary matings. I think, you know, a lot of people fall in love with a certain body type. And then, you know, when you breed a bull, that's the same body type as female. A lot of times it does, in my opinion, doesn't work as well. So, you know, for me constantly, I'm, we're very, we try to be very critical of the cattle. So I think that's the only way you can advance. And we, we approach our business that way too. And so we're looking for, okay, so what is an ant, what is a female lack? And so what sire, and I don't care if I own the sire or somebody else's. I think that a lot of people uh, think that people want to breed their own stuff, but I'm very open to breeding everything. Cause at the end of the day, I'm trying to produce a better product. So looking at what a, animal has um, and what they're lacking and try to mate it to where you know you're hoping to get the blend of it where they're the best traits of the two animals are coming through now it doesn't work all the time but the further down the genetic field we get it gets more and more predictable and like with any other product you're trying to produce a predictable product so having the having the deep proven pedigrees now is is proving it a, a lot better and more accurate when you're making those mating decisions yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying about the predictability. I it's uh, well, kind of talking about that, you know, uh, one one animal that always stands out to me, and I'm sure everybody knows about her, would be Oasis. You know, can you can you kind of give us some details of how that that deal come about? Because she's been a very impactful cow across the whole breed. Uh, just talk about her a little bit. Yeah, and even going back further than that, I'd really, you know. Before the cattle work, you had you could have a really good looking animal, but sometimes you hadn't seen their the especially the dam of the cow, so you really didn't know if it was a fluke or if the animal was a real deal. And then so over the years, because again I've been doing it since 
you know, since the early 80s, late 70s myself, and, you know, really understanding which animals were true. And so the the six over two line that Lee Adair had, and then the Miss Farrah 293 Vanna line, those two really kind of emerged. And there were some other good lines like Jungle Red and all that. But for the most part, those were the two lines that really emerged as consistent, you know, good milking, fertile, longevity, um, good market presence, uh, could have bulls and females. So really those were the two that started the predictability. So Oasis, you know, she she came largely out of the six over two line. And it was a funny story. We, um, her mother um, her or her grandmother, Sex Appeal, we actually, I bought a pick of calves from Lee Adair out of um, six over two and in that pick, it was a, it was a lot of animals, but four of them were Ranger Pride and six over two, which was Miss Lee and Sugar Ann and all those. So I thought, obviously, I was going to get one of those. When we went to pick, you know, those were good, but uh, Sex Appeal was actually the best, the Levi daughter out of six over two. So, so that's who we took um, in, in the pick. Um, and from that, we made it her to uh, Sandman, who was a Vanna son. And then from that, we made it her Cavalier, and which put in the Kentucky Princess and the and Spartacus, the, the power in that, and really combined. And that's that's what produced uh, Oasis. That's awesome hearing the, the background on that and the, the thoughts of putting pedigrees together and, and making that predictability out of that. That's That's really neat. And then uh, just seeing the success of, uh, it's hard for me to remember when she came about, but it seems like for nearly a decade now, she's just been the, one of the most sought out pedigrees in the in the in the market. Well, and she's all over the place. I mean, yeah, she, she, she's in just about you know. You look on this piece of paper, a registration paper, and you there there's I mean she's there, and that's that's impressive in itself. Yeah, and she lived a long time. You know, she lived to 20, and she was, you know, super fertile, great milker, was fertile all the way up until the end. And so, you know, she produced, I mean, she has more females and males registration than any cow by far just because of her her ability to produce a lot of embryos. And, and even to that degree, um, you know, we did a, ended up doing a lot of in vitro on her, and her in vitro embryos, you know, they take it like a 70% take. So, I mean, it just... Everything along the line, it was kind of that perfect combination that everything really worked. And the really great thing is her daughters also produce like that. And then her, you know, there's been obviously a lot of great sons of hers and they're fertile and, and produce really good animals too. So, you know, the consistency and the performance that she puts in there, you know, is, is has really been good for us and hopefully for the breed too. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. Um, you know, going back to what you said a little bit ago, I, a word that sticks in my head and people are really going to get tired of me saying this, uh, one of these days, but you said predictability and that's key. And Bruce, uh, Mr. Bruce Robbins was on here last year and we were talking about, um, you know, how to, how to find predictability, looking at pedigrees and seeing what's produced over and over and over. I just think that gets looked over a lot of times. Um, people may get something stuck in their head and even though it may not be wrong, it, it's, if it's, they don't have that predictability, it's going to be really hard to know what you've got coming. Yeah. I think, you know, historically, if you go back for a long period of time, there's been, you know, animals that get quote promoted that aren't the real deal. So I think people get kind of weird on pedigree sometime and, and I, and I don't blame them, but it to, so to me, it's the ones that are proven over a long period of time they're not the quote shiny object or you know the latest thing fad coming along so you know and, and to me it's like any other product i mean we're in manufacturing and so predictability in your processes and in your product is extremely important and so anytime you can do that and especially being in the cattle business we all know it's expensive to raise purebred cows and so you really want to increase your odds on that so trying to have the predictable animals is important. And I've always for years, and I've had a lot of friends that do this, people like to chase things. They like to chase, as I said earlier, you know, as humans, we we subscribe to the shiny objects and we're always trying to find that shiny object or or we get called up in the single trait selections. And when you do that, you kind of just veer off 
and then you lose that predictability. So we try to really stay down the middle and kind of resist doing that. <clears throat> I guess kind of moving forward, I'd like to see if y'all would want have, want to just uh, would you care to share maybe with some of the young and up and coming bulls that you got g coming up? Yes, sir. So right now. Now, two of our uh, main bulls that we're using is um, Force of Nature. So he's a uh, Mother Nature uh, son going back to Oasis and Captain Sugar. You know what those great daughters have done and even sons with Sugar Britches and Dreamcatcher and Sugar Bear. So anyway, he comes from great lines and then he's straight out of primate. And obviously that bull speaks for himself. Uh, he's one of the best bulls arguably in the breed. Uh, and so anyway, that bull, he's just a great combination of those two great families and he's built well, and he's he's got good scan data as well. And so we've just really been trying to push him, promote him, um, just in our herd, and then also in other herds. We've had um, Clark Jones and Next Gen, and then here recently Jordan Taylor um, buy in on him, and so they're actually part owners on him now. So they've been able to use uh, his semen in their breeds, and it's really he's really making an impact. So we're really excited about him and what he's going to be doing for us. And then we also have Checkmate. So he's a uh, Sugar Bridge's son, and he's one of these big bulls. And he actually – we've got three calves on the ground right now out of him this spring, and they're out of some done lighter cows, and every single one of them is dark red. And so, I mean, that's that's those bull right now. The breed's really calling for that dark red. And so he's really throwing that. And so he's he's done a great job in his scan data. He's got a great IMF and a ribeye and so he's just he's another one of those good bulls that we're we're really excited to have and really excited to be using i've seen they a all. picture of checkmate and man he looks like a real i mean he looks like a real stud in that picture yes, uh, in the calvin and it, that was no staged picture i was just out there riding to look at the feeder one day and he was standing there posing i'd pull out my phone <laughs> and just take a picture of him i mean he looked so good Oh, that's a phone picture? Wow. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was actually. I need one of those phones. I had to send it to Penny to clean it up, and she's like, you know, get the fence out of the background and all that. She's like, really? And I'm like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's that's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Owen yeah. takes good pictures. That's uh, – you never know sometimes you're at the <clears throat> right place at the right time on that deal. Yeah. In that picture. but Well, and that's uh, a skill yeah. that – that's a skill that – is sometimes looked at looked over is good picture taking i can't take a picture to save my life but my wife is really good at it so she knows if i say that i took a picture i mean we already know that it's not going to be good <laughs> <laughs> do y'all offer semen on those for sale on those bulls we have we we've offered it in our in the uh, uh internet sales that we've had we've had a couple of internet so and so we've sold some limited amount in in that okay. um that's okay. just kind of been what we've been doing lately is just offering limited amounts i got you cool deal well y'all need to make sure to be watching for the next one that they have if y'all want to get get in on those bulls absolutely uh, going in speaking to, of uh yeah go ahead josh i was just gonna say going into kind of you hear cottage farms a lot of people hear cottage farms genetics as well and um maybe don't put two and two together can can you talk a little bit about cottage farm genetics and maybe how that came about and how that works out with with you all yeah it's it's a separate business um but it's still here on our farm it's a you know it's a it's a bull collection and embryo collection facility and wesley Kleppel runs it and um does a super job has for decades now um it actually came out of uh spring creek used to be a a bull stud over in Collierville and it was owned by Dr. Myers and Wesley worked for him. And obviously in, in Memphis, the subdivisions were moving out and they sold it. And, and so Wesley just called to let us know. And I'm like, and this is when I was in college. So this was whenever 35 years ago. And I told my dad, I said, look, we, we need that here in the, in the South. And so why don't we take it? We had this barn, the bull stud, it actually, uh, been our sale facility. I said, why don't we convert that and make it into a, a bull stud? And so that's what we did. Uh, that would have been in the mid eighties at that time and uh, mid to, you know, probably 88, something like that. Um, and so we converted our sale facility into uh, the bull stud, which is cottage farm genetics. And so they house about, I don't know, 20 something bulls at any given time. And he does um, uh, traditional flushing and now, uh, has partnered with Transova and does in vitro 
uh, flushing here too. So uh, Wesley does a really good job. He's super detailed on um, what he puts up and all. He's anybody that knows Wesley knows he's very, very picky about the type of semen and embryos he he puts up. Yeah, that's all I've always said. If if you have it put up at, with Wesley doing it, you can trust it to be be grade one and and a better. You know. Yeah. He's one of the hardest working people I've ever known. And we work hard, but he works he works hard. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's his a, wife does too. Well, and I'd guess, rather have uh, a lot I'd I'd rather have a lot stricter um I guess I'd say parameters than to have something looser and and not near as good a quality. So I mean that that says a lot about cottage farm genetics and, and what they're trying to do there. Yeah, you know, he'll only put up. He won't. He won't compromise. If somebody says, "Hey, will you put it up?" He'll say, "No, I'm not doing it." Because he just, you know, if you get burned doing that, it's just bad. And of course, he does the embryo work too. And so, you know, it's nothing more frustrating than flushing a cow and getting a bunch of unfertilized embryos because the semen wasn't top quality. Uh, I guess kind of moving forward, y'all care to talk us walk us through the the sale coming up in June. Yeah, we're going to have a really, um, really good offering. You know, we, we try to all the time, but at this time, I think we really have a, a lot of things came together and it's our 50th anniversary. And, you know, we and Clark always end up, you know, we don't sell what we, I mean, we raise the cows to sell. So we sell, we try to sell a lot of really good animals. Um, most of them we would want to keep or all of them we'd want to keep. Um, but, you know, we, we don't have that big of an operation. So, We've got, I think, somewhere around 12 to 14 own daughters of Oasis, several daughters of Deja Vu, and then we're selling four full sisters to Force of Nature in the sale. So we've got, and then we've got a lot of really good brass monkey animals. Um, selling this year, um, there's over 20 really strong bulls in the sale. No, no that's not... People look at that time of year as not a great time to to sell bulls, but I look at it as it's a perfect time because you can get the bull in, you can acclimate him to your place. You're not rushed at the end to try to buy a bull because you've got to have one in the next month. So to me, it's if people think about it, it's actually a very good time to buy. So, you know, we're gonna we're gonna do that. We, you know, historically years ago, we used to sell a lot of bulls, that many bulls or more in in our June or July sales back in the nineties and all did well with it. And then we kind of went away from it. So we're trying to resurrect that and, and do that again. So we're, like I said, we're very proud of the offering. I know Clark's going to come with some really strong cattle too. He always does. And so um, we're both very proud of what we're offering. And we go every year and you talking 20 bulls plus all the, all the females, that's going to be a barn full. <laughs> yeah it is barn full they're having to put a few more pins up actually i guarantee it that's a that's a barn full but i mean there's the cool part about selling the bulls this year you know I, we've been in this since 19 18 into 18 uh into 19 and so we've other than that very first year we started we've been coming out every year uh since to, to your set to y'all sell and it's always it's a good time good food it's enjoyable to be around everybody I mean, even if you don't come and buy anything, it's still a great time to come look at some good quality animals, um, you know, network with people. Cause there's normally a ton of people there, but I think putting the bulls in there really gives, I mean, it truly is something for everybody at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And a point you made there was good. I've always, I've always thought that, you know, especially somebody that's new to newer getting in, but really everybody there's, you know, there's a, there's a few sales every year that you really should put on your calendar and really try to go to. I'm not just talking about ours. I'm talking about, you know, several people's just to understand. And it's great educational. You're around the people and there's nobody, you know, like I said, I, we're in business and I'm applying all over the country. There's no better people than people in the beef master business. And that's, that's truth. I've been doing this forever and they really are, great people so being able to go and see is is really an investment everybody should make in in going to you know at least three or four top type, type sales just to understand what's going on and, and meet the people and see see the cattle and the fish is, is always good on friday it sure night. is you'll get fed <laughs> while you're here yeah. the fish is outstanding right. outstanding uh but yeah i mean I, I think it's great and i think this is if i've if I read it right, this is the 24th sale, Southern Tradition sale. I think we lost him again. Yep, we did. Yeah. 
Let's just wait. Just wait for a minute. See if he comes back on. Can you hear me now? You got you. Yeah. Yes, sir. My dang internet. I was just saying, um, if I read this correctly, it's the 24th sale, Southern Tradition sale. To be honest, I don't know. We started in 82, so it's uh, it's with with actual production sales. I hadn't really counted. It's it's somewhere around that. If that's what it says on there, it is. <laughs> <laughs> enough. It's enough. <laughs> yeah, it's enough, yeah. Well, I guess kind of wrapping things up, uh, we usually ask this question, of, especially for the first time coming on, is uh, since, especially since y'all been doing it, a good while uh you know been doing it i guess looking like said in the late 70s early 80s you're probably running on 40 something plus years uh so what would be a good piece of advice that if you would, was to give a new breeder well like i said before one you know one i wouldn't get in too big a hurry there's always cows and so it's you know i think people they get antsy and they want they feel like they've got to go do something immediately but there's always cows coming along uh, and, and good cows and, and so I would be patient. I would really study, take times like everything else. You know, a lot of people, they're in business beforehand, then they get in the cattle, make the investment in time and all that. So, again, going to those sales is important. And I think networking, you know, I, I always tell new people that find three breeders that have been doing it a long time, that you admire their program, and give them a call. They'll all talk with you. I've never met anybody that wouldn't, um, and, and not necessarily that they're you want to buy a cow from them. Just pick their brain and see, because like I said, these people in the business are great people, and they want to see other people succeed. So they'll give you good, honest advice and, and take the time to do that. Go look at their herds. Don't just go to the sales. Go out and look at their herds. That's what I did in college. I, can, I, left, I went to Texas A&M, and I left every Thursday night and I went every weekend. I was not at AM one weekend my entire college career because I was out doing cows. And that really gave me the background, that that time investment. So, you know, invest the time, find the people. And I'm not you don't copy anybody else because you can't just copy somebody and be who they are. But you can take three or four of the top breeders and kind of emulate it and make it your own. I, I, I think too many people, they listen to a hundred opinions and then they're pulling a hundred different directions and they don't have a program at that time. And so I really, and I always think that's a shame because then they, you know, then they have to course correct and, and they, you know, they overcome that, but you really need to figure out and, and everybody's program is going to be different. If you're in South Florida, it's going to be different than it is if you're in Jackson, Tennessee, or if you're in West Texas. So, you know, whatever's going to work best for your area and your and your and your buyers. That's that's well said. I, I agree with you hundred oh. percent. and some advice like that can, like you mentioned, can save you a lot of time and years because the cattle business is is measured in in pretty much decades in a way. So, yeah, uh, and don't get caught up in the hype. A lot of people get caught up in the latest fad. You know, as I said, the, uh, single trait selection. I was on the breed improvement committee when we did the sheath you know, the, when we did what we wanted to on the sheath and we had some sheath problems back in the eighties and earlier, and this was the mid eighties when we did this. And, you know, on the committee, we said, you know, between the two and the three, that was kind of ideal. Well, what humans do is they go to extreme. So coming out of that within two months, everybody was wanting a one sheath. And so everybody forgot there was a bull attached to the sheath and they, they just wanted this clean sheath. And so we had a couple of years there where we, there was a lot of sorry animals bred because they were just single trait selecting. So we got to be careful on that. And as I said before, the shiny object syndrome and the diamond in the rough, people are always looking for that special animal out there that's hidden somewhere. There's probably a reason it's hidden because it's just, it's not, it's not something you really want. So to me, it's doing the proven and, and, you know, and really getting behind and staying middle of the road. Don't go to extreme on anything. Yeah, that's that's great advice as well. Well, I guess we're kind of running out of time, but uh, is there anything else y'all want to say before we close up? Uh, I would just say don't be afraid to reach out to us. Our uh, information's on BBU, or like I said, we have Facebook. Uh, you can contact us through that or anything. We'd love for you to come out and show you around or talk about cows or whatever else. We, we don't mind. We always have time, so don't be afraid to reach out, and we'd love to help you out. Uh, all right. Well, that's good. Uh, just remember, uh, everybody that's listening, the, the cottage farm sale, uh, June 22nd. Is that right? Yes, sir. Y'all come out for June 22nd. Uh, that 
they usually feed you on Friday night, and it's going to be a good time and and uh, even better cattle. So, but like I said, we really appreciate y'all coming on, and 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 thank you for that. And definitely thank y'all for sponsoring us. We can't do it without y'all. Absolutely. Thank y'all for letting us come on. Yeah, thank y'all for doing this. Good service. Appreciate that. Well, anyway, I guess that's all we got for tonight. We'll see you. Okay, yes, thank y'all. Well, we want to thank everybody for listening to the Beefmaster Banner Podcast. Uh, please know that we are on Apple Podcast, Spotify, and we are on YouTube. Just search Beefmaster Banner. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. We love hearing from you, um, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you.